you're looking over your little eggs. Yeah, I am. <laughs> There's a really nice experimental hook we'll talk about. Is this the one I was using? Liesel says hi. Liesel made it. All right. <laughs> Uh, question was, any tips on getting that center section clean? I always struggle. Center section. Or oh, here, in the middle of the bowl, or the box, where the two bulges meet in the side. Can you clarify, whoever asked that? Yeah. I think he said yes, that's that's it. Yeah, it's it's about dropping your hook down so you can get a skew. And if you don't have a tapered hook, uh, you're gonna get better uh, cutting angle. If it's tapered, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to move over to your left more to get the right angle. If it's not tapered, uh, you can stand in more standard position. So that's the one way. The other way is to get a, a a bent shaft reverse grind. So you're using a different part of the hook. You're using this this part right here to skew. And if you come over here, Jasmine, maybe we can do some close-ups. Okay. This one will be good. Okay. So you know we're aiming for that 10 degree cut off of the the arc. So every time you make a cut, you're making a little ledge, and that's an arc that is a certain distance out from the axis. A little bit of, I'm gonna just break down cutting theory just quickly. So at that point, now that intersects uh, the shape we have, right? I mean, I could be out here from the axis, but there's nothing to turn. So it doesn't matter at this point. But So we're talking about the context is there's a block of wood or block of anything on the lathe. And when you touch the surface, the surface limits how you can approach. You can't cut too deep. I can't put the tip of this into the very center of that block of wood. It's impossible. So I'm always on the surface, cutting along, and every place I touch the hook, I need to adjust the cutting angle. So around 10 degrees, and just below the surface that's spinning in front of the blade. So if you have a big bulge, you're gonna have to be way out here to catch that bulge first. And then there's the 10 degrees and the twist that's cutting just below the surface. So that ledge, is the place that we I talk about when I'm talking about uh, the angle. So with this bend shaft tool, and you can zoom in closer, I can turn deeper, I can turn the cut deeper, and I can still, and I can drop it even, and I can still skew. So I can turn deeper and skew at 10 degrees. The other hook, If it has a taper to it, from wide to tip, to get the same skew, you're gonna to have to move your tool way over to the left, and you might not be able to because of your foot pedal, as pole turns were bound to the pedal. And, or you could drop it way below center to counter that taper. You can use the tip of the hook to cut, it's okay. There's no rules against that. And unlike electrically turning, we can turn below center or above if we ever need to, although it's rare to turn above center. Below center is very common. So I could make the same cut, the same skewing cut, pointing below the surface. I turn my tool. I can cut there just as well. But it's harder to see. And the further down you go around that diameter, the further the... The, the force of the spinning object forces the tool out of your hand and out, out, out and around. It's the same way uh, the tip of a chainsaw bar, the chain is spinning like this, you have a chainsaw bar, and if you touch the piece of wood on that part, it wants to go. And it's the same here, you run that tool down there and it wants to go. 
So you don't want to go below center. Even though you could, you'd have to hold it back. So you get this bent shaft hook, and then you can get that skew you need and still be able to turn it deep underneath the wood. If you had an untapered hook, this is a little small. Again, I'm going to catch right now because I'm deviated from 10 degrees. And I'm being relative about the 10. So the more I turn this way, the more it's going to want to catch. So a tapered hook on this section isn't going to be as good as one that's untapered. And then I have an experimental hook that actually, before I scrolled it, it actually gets wider. And so when I scroll it, you can see that it's actually wider here. It's flared. It's flared at this, at this point. So that's going to make a really great skew. And I can still go below, I can still turn it to go below the surface and I don't have to go below the center where it will pull me out of, pull, pull the tool out of my hands. This will make a great core cutting tool too. Have you used that yet? I haven't. It's the, probably the first one ever made. Who knows? <laughs> And more, more dangling carrots. I'll have a diagram of it in my book. <laughs> if it works. It'll work. I already know. So this, this is actually the same thing as what I just showed you. with. I'm just using a different part of the hook. But it's still the same angle. This is still the same skew. That's how I know it works. It's just the same thing. It's just a different part of the hook. So you can see I'm skewing. about 10 degrees off of that point, that, the point of intersection arc. <laughs> Where's my... Uh... Well, I saw it in the corner there. Oh, it fell. Yeah. That's some really geeked out stuff there. People enjoy that. Um, so now I'm looking at the shape. I'm gonna flip it around and take this bottom down a little bit. And it's a little boxy square shape. So I'm gonna try to get some of this material off, which then prepares for the lid area. Remember, always cut on a pivot. Aiming 10% or 10%, 10 degrees from that, wherever the tool touches. I can be down here 10 degrees. I can be up here 10 degrees off. Here I can't get the hook under the wood, but here I can with a twist. And as I move across, the more, the more and more away I get from 10 degrees to 90. 90 will catch. <coughs> so I got to be mindful not to go past maybe 20. It'll start to grab. I'll have to shift positions or change tools or drop it below center. This is 
a good angle. <laughs> well, I can't tell either. Can you can you look at it? Just a minute. I'm finding the hook tool that I need. Where did it go? Uh, yeah, that's okay. Mm. Let me see. Okay. <laughs> I'm like ducking around this camera. <laughs> Downside to not turning much anymore on the pole is a lot of the hooks I, I don't remember which ones are ready to go and which ones are sharp. Okay, you have to move the camera. don't want to be limited by your tools. Uh, it's, it's rarely the case where your tools will limit you, but, it, but in turning, it's, it's definitely uh, a factor. Whereas like spoon carving, any sharp hook will make a hole, a bowl. Any straight knife will make a spoon. But with turning tools, it's a little bit trickier because of the uh, the geometry we're dealing with and the, how that's superimposed over, over the grain of the wood and the shapes you're turning. Um, if you're turning just open bowls, then you can get away with three hooks. If you start getting into end grain and, and some of this locking lid boxes, you, you've suddenly gone into having need a dozen hooks or ten different hooks. You, you need to be able to make them um, because you can't buy them. And uh, they're all, I mean, you can buy them, you always make them, I sell them once in a while, but um, they're gonna break and you're gonna need new ones. And so it's just a kind of a tricky spot, but I advocate for learning how to do it. People like that other angle. Yeah. You can be over here looking, but I just, not on my shoulder, I can't get all right. I can't get to the, to the, uh, I can't see the shape. So this is fine. It's okay? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'm just putting in, I wouldn't rest it on my shoulder though. Don't rest. I don't think so, it'll move. Okay. There's this little lip, and then the thickness of the lid drops down, and it's flush. So I'm chopping in or cutting. I'm cutting in this this ledge, and then I'm going to cut in this inside ledge to let this rim bead, whatever you want to call it, and allow for the thickness. That's what I'm doing right now. And 
And whenever you're cutting in like the foot or uh, these little edges, they always look best if they're at a 90 or they're really sharp. So if they, if they come down, if your foot, if your, if your bowl is coming down and then your foot is on an angle, it just doesn't look good. It's not crisp enough at the intersection. You bring that in so it's vertical uh, and a foot, you even bring it in just slightly and it'll pop design-wise. It's way better. Like, everybody will agree. So same with this area here. You want that crisp line, the light hits it, the shadows hit it. And so this bent shaft reverse grind allows you to get right in and this is where adjusting the tool rest really matters because you can get uh, a better pivot point closer. It brings the tool up and allows you to cut in straighter versus on an angle like this, you, you, you won't be able to you cut an angle. Of course, you can do that with different shape hooks too. So I'm going to actually step off my lathe and use my right foot on the pedal just for that for that 90 degree Ooh, trick move. And then back to turning. So I went in extra deep and then now I'm gonna turn the top surface down a little bit. So it just gives me a little bit room, more room to move. I don't have to worry about being perfect because that 90 degree cut's kind of tricky. You might need a couple of temps. So give yourself extra here. You cut it in and then turn the top surface down. It's a lot easier to turn the top surface down than it is to cut the notch accurately. And then down below, I'm gonna cut the inside now. Kind of clearing some material away and that they don't have to be at the same height inside and out remember this inside just is accommodating the thickness of the rim of the lid with the thickness of the lid so now i need to clean that up on the inside and jasmine you'll have to move uh, should i have come to step. around the other I, way i just no they can see they, okay you just won't be able to see but has a little movement which is interfering so I'm gonna I'm gonna back off I'm gonna lean on my tool rest to pull it tight against my notch so I'm pulling back as I pivot if I push it kind of moves I could probably push too but then the nature of the arc uh, pushes the tool back and makes it makes it sloppy so I'm gonna move back resist against look at this again so I just cut this area I haven't I haven't hollowed but this needs to be uh, perpendicular to the axis it needs to be flat so that the lid which is flat fits on nicely so perpendicular meaning straight out this way not sloped not sloped and, I, and I've already done it. Okay. Now I'm going to hollow. 
Uh, maybe, Jasmine, you should be over here so you can okay. see. Owen Thomas says hi. Oh, hey, Owen Aaron wants to know how snug the fit should be for a, um, a friction fit box. How snug friction fit? should yeah, the like lid the fit? One, like the one you just made, Aaron. Um, I would leave it like slightly loose. I know that's a vague <laughs> term of measurement, but um, a sixteenth. Because you, it depends on, on how the grain orientation is on lid and base. Um, a little bit of slop is okay because when you put it in and lock it, it's okay. Uh, it shouldn't be too tight when they're still green. And of course, don't dry them together. Um, and you can always carve the inside of the, of the lid a little bit. No one's going to see that. Um, I tend to not carve the tenon of the, the lip of the lid, uh, base because uh, it's visible and kind of awkward and you end up tending to cut them like that, and they really should be like that. Um, so I would say a sixteenth, or just slightly snug, you know, just slight resistance. Depends on your wood too, you have to, like, when I get a new batch of wood, when I was turning these a lot, I would make one, and then I would watch what happened. And then, okay, actually that was too tight. Or, oh, that was too loose. It, it, it shrunk more than I thought. And, uh, and then go from there and then pr proceed to make the rest of them. If you're dealing with ever-changing wood because you're doing it once in a while, uh, it will be harder to ascertain what's, what's going on and how much you're going to need to allow for as the wood dries in your log yard. The shrinking is going to be less and less. Uh, but generally, they're shrinking together, so it doesn't matter too much. All right, so now I'm just plunging in like a regular bowl. There's not much to see. It'll be hard for Jasmine to get it. But... So this reverse grind, I'm just plunging it in, working on the core side, working on the bowl side, making some room. I don't want to remove that lip, so I have to be very careful. So just like rim cutting, you know, you're going to slide over to your left and try to get that tool edge as parallel to possible so you don't catch. slightly bigger mandrel so I have a lot of power and then with the foot treadle being with the drive strap being directly below I have a lot of force 
that applies directly. Just going straight down into it. Should have probably made a smaller one. <laughs> I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> this whole day turning into a lot of work. <laughs> some trick moves here. First off, I'm gonna, the <coughs> inside surface here is just slightly sloped toward the, the bottom. I need to make it parallel and eventually I need to cut down into this hollow area. So first I'm gonna make it straight or even slightly um, angled the other way toward the hollow and I'm not going to use the upside down tool I'm going to use just a regular tool to get a little bit more a um, little bit more edge engaged than the other one does it matter about the wood being from a different bit of large diameter wood, or should they be pieces that grew on the same bit of tangential wood? They just need to be vertical grain. of similar vertical grain. If you're close to the pith, there's a little angle there. I'll make them both the same. of that tool by moving the tool rest up, making it steeper. To make a tricked out lathe, it would be cool sometimes, I think, to like have a taller tool rest that you could plop on. You know, then you could get a different, a different approach. That would be a cool like mod modification. I don't uh, turn much anymore with this machine, so I've kind of stopped innovating, but uh, for those that are watching, we should try it. pushing the tool down and you're sliding on your the flesh of your hand as a shock absorber you let let it go a little bit and it sticks it slips 
not too fast. All right, I'm gonna take a little bit of that core down. So if you have spikes that are too thick, you'll have, you'll have cracks in the core, and then you run the risk of the, this breaking before your bowl or box is done. So it's okay. If I did make a bad catch, I could, I could crack that. And if my drive strap is too close, I can also crack it, especially if your mandrel is doing this. And you move that over, and on the downward one, boom, cracks. All right. We're going to run it in reverse now. So with each depression, the power is going in this counterclockwise. And I'm going to use my nesting hook upside down across underneath the core. And I'm going to pivot toward the rim. hollow form you want to go from widest to narrowest so from rim of a bowl to the base so wide to narrow and the way the grain orientation is in relation to the shape that you're turning you want to go with the fibers and so if you can imagine this as a bowl with the bottom taken out of it we're going to be hollowing from the widest point toward the base. And that's what I'm doing here. And that's the trick with the reverse is that you can use nesting tools, which you probably already have. And you're going to get a better skewing cut than you would if you were to try to go forward with a hook that's all the way back wrapped, wrapped in. You can do it, of course, but it's just a trickier tool to make. And when you already have um, nesting hooks. Uh, yeah, I prefer spike mandrels in general for me. Uh, when I teach, I use tenons because they just hold better. When you, when you get a catch, the tenons are more solid. On a spike mandrel, if you get a catch, um, a lot of times you've destroyed the connection and it doesn't work. It doesn't work after that. And then end grain, of course, the tenon mandrel is quite a solid 
and that counters the extreme uh, resistance of end grain turning on the tool. <coughs> so this is the kind of the doldrums part. Um, I'll keep going and then we'll, we'll fit the lid. I kind of question whether I should show the whole thing. It's probably going to be 20 minutes of hollowing. Um, maybe we go to the end of the hour and like last time, I think we, uh, skipped fast we, forwarded, we fast -forwarded and then forwarded, right. did another live when you were ready to do the right. end bit. I can, I'll, 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 I'll mandrel up, um, the, the lid and I have a, a scraper tool and everything to make the notch. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be the best approach. And if you don't tune in, it'll be recorded so you can come back and watch it. But I'll keep going for a little while till the hour is done. People can ask questions mm -hmm. and watch. You're at 38 uh, minutes now. Okay. I'm not going to do it too much until I get closer. So that's enough hollow for now, and then I'm going to flip it back into forward. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little bit of a slope or a ledge here. And then I can go down, down, down again and try with my bent shaft to hollow it the other way from about here and come back. I'll leave like a ledge there and then I'll come back in reverse. I don't know, just thinking about it, like, I don't think at the time much many people were making these. Robin may have made a few when I, I got into it and, you know, as far as I know, the reverse turning and nesting hooks and stuff something I kind of brought to the scene and of course was happy to share it with everybody else. I don't know if Owen's still listening, but we all got together and turned a bunch of boxes and end grain and stuff at Brookhouse Woods of uh, 2017. And Yoav. Yoav, yeah. yeah. Owen and Maddie Sharif, and Sharif. Sharif, Maddie. Is that the core blaster you use for the reversal? Uh, when I reverse, no, it's a nesting hook. It's a nesting hook. Mm -hmm. So the, the hook sharp edge is up as it's curled. So like when you're cutting nests.
just work it on the bottom now a little bit. Mm -hmm. Making some room. After a while, the shavings get kind of stuck in there. Have you tried a variable diameter mandrel, as in Joseph Moxon book print from 1670? Uh, I have, and I didn't like it. That was just me. Um, the main reason at the time was I had a fixed pole up in my rafters, and I couldn't move its location. So the mandrel can be moved if you move the poppets around. If this is fixed, you have to move your poppets around. And it's really freaking complicated. And once you move your tailstock, nothing's working right. And so these tools, the li they're lining up is a little bit crude. And so if you move this headstock, then you end up tweaking things a lot. And uh, it's, it's just not good. So if you get this fixed in a good spot, you tend to not want to move it. And if the pole is fixed, you can't have a step mandrel because it just won't stay. It'll, it'll jump up or it'll wear out if it's on an angle, it'll wear out on the step. So I, didn't, I abandoned it. Um, with the setup now in here with this bungee, um, I, can, I can change the location. And then a step mandrel probably would work, especially with the uh, the movable pedal. I can move the pedal over, and my sway bar has holes on it, so I can move this in different spots too. Uh, so uh, it would work, but you'd have to have a, a really versatile, adjustable treadle sway pole setup to make it work properly. Otherwise, it would just be more trouble than what it's worth. There's no need, honestly, there's no need to change this uh, diameter that much because we can just increase speed by pumping. It doesn't change the gearing per se. There's kind of two levels of speed with pull lathe turning. It's the diameter of the thing attached to this diameter. Those two are interrelated. And then we have our pedals per, or uh, rotations per pump that's related to this diameter, interrelated with the diameter you're turning. So in machinist world, I forget what it's called. It's kind of like you have RPMs. That's based on how fast I'm pumping. And then you have a kind of a miles per hour. It's a surface per minute as how fast you're going here. And those are interrelated gearing wise. So you can make up for variations just by pumping faster. Or with a pole lathe, you can pump fast and light. And this is where the cyborg thing comes in. Or you can pump uh, hard and, and slow. And so you can change the power tube of the, the, uh, the applied force by your leg and the speed at which you're pumping. So vary, you know, varying this mandrel you know, half an inch isn't gonna do anything um, that your body can't make up for. And again, if you wanted a really small one, uh, it's not gonna work for this anyway. So bigger might give you more power, but it's gonna be really slow, because the bigger this is, the slower it turns per pump. So you're gonna, you're gonna be working really hard best to just try to get within a half an inch sweet spot um, so it's not necessarily needed I haven't seen Moxon's book and some of that's yeah some of that's for spindle turning um, and they had all kinds of different lathes with different weird spiky chucks and stuff for that so I'd be curious to see if that was for spindle turning or bowl turning tangential turning too um, tend to overthink things as humans um, and you know solve problems that we don't need to solve you know I do that myself but um, Jasmine roll your eyes <laughs> well because you do that a lot too <laughs>
You don't appreciate my good ideas. Solving problems <laughs> that don't need to be solved. Right? There's always room for improvement. Hmm. After 3,000 years or 4,000 years, I don't know. Yeah. It's our creative mind. Yeah, the Can't be stopped. Is the improvement is the machine you're leaning on over there, the electric machine. <laughs> tapered in, uh, down, and uh, do one more pass, and then uh, I'll put it in reverse. think about hooks and for any of you um, pulley turners out there um, I'm honestly thinking that tapered hooks serve very little purpose uh, an untapered hook is it just works better all around and you anytime you need a little skew you just have to twist your wrist anyway so I think again some of the sharpening from the antiques that we see you know they sharpened the tips down I, I don't know but I have been turning less, or making less and less hooks with any taper, and I haven't been able to notice any difference. and forth, hollowing, uh, you know, we're moving the tool into this hollow, this area here, working down, coming back in reverse. Uh, we'll go back and forth a bunch of times, probably not even halfway there yet for, for thickness. Um, so let's, we'll shut it down and then in a half an hour or so, sorry for you folks in Europe getting past your bedtime maybe, but um, shut it down for a half an hour, 40 minutes or something. And I'll get it hollowed. And uh, I'll probably just sever it right off. There's no need, it's the same as the bowl. And you get the idea um, without actually seeing one in person. Uh, none of it won't make sense, the actual cross-section, but 
and then I'll put a lid on and I'll show you guys how to make the lid. The lid's quite quick and there's some cool tricks uh, with that as well. So let's uh, meet back here in a half an hour, 45, 45 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. And again, if you can't make it, it'll be on YouTube mm -hmm. or on the Instagram TV. But this last question, do you find a hook with no taper? The back of the hook can contact the inside of the bowl, limiting the inner curve you can achieve? It has nothing to do with the taper. That's back bend. So all the hooks have this, this back bend here. So the taper I'm talking about is this, this taper before you scroll. Um, and the back bend uh, gets your tool out of the way. Uh, so all the tools have back bend. Even, you know, this little reverse bend, reverse grind, back bend. You know, you can make different shapes. Even the nesting hooks. There's a little bit of a back bend there. Mm. So, so that's what I'm talking about. This taper, you know, this this taper here get get actually down in the tip. Sometimes you need to use the tip and it's actually tapered the wrong way and you're not skewing properly. Mm. That's why I made this uh, this flared scrolled hook. So when you're working on a core, let's see it this way. Okay, don't move it so quickly. When you're working on a core, you're gonna wanna skew from the core down to the bottom of the bowl. And you're gonna want your tool angled this way. Normal hooks are tapered this way, and it makes it worse. So you have to make up for it by dropping your tool way down, or running it level and turning it in like this when you're cutting in for nesting. So this hook should solve that problem. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, cool, thanks. I have a tool with no taper, but it also has no back bend. Yeah, they so all, should, that have, was the all issue. should have back bends. Mm -hmm. Most people get that wrong when they see photos that the back bend is very important. Not much, you know, no more than a quarter inch. You can always move your pivot point or your tool rest, to, you know, to make accommodations. But. Okay, signing off. See you later. Visit our website, woodspirithandcraft.com. If you so wish. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in a bit.